everybody, welcome to beautiful Belize. I am Frank Connolly, I'm the sustainability director here for Sanctuary Belize City River Wildlife Reserve. I'm shooting today here right in front of the savannah, which is this very unique ecosystem that we have as the heart and core of a conservation area that it makes up the City River Wildlife Reserve. The City River Wildlife Reserve is 14,000 acres. It is a bona fide land conservation trust, a nonprofit corporation, making up 14,000 acres. How big is that? 22 square miles. To give you some reference of how big that is, it's a Manhattan-sized piece of property that is set in conservation to protect a watershed that is off behind me here by about five, six miles, as well as all the way down the City River out to the beautiful Caribbean. And when you have the two dominant forces of nature, mountain and ocean, sitting in such close proximity to one another in this small 22 square mile area, an amazing amount of biodiversity and interdependent relationships play out. And it is our responsibility in putting this development together, a literal city in the jungle, to make sure that our environmental impacts are limited to the sense that we do not break up the interdependent relationships of all the things that are happening from the mountains all the way out to the sea. And I want to get into that with you in a little bit. Let me tell you a little bit about myself, the, my background, how I came here, and that'll give you some context to the type of metrics that we are trying to preserve and making sure that we are able to take this beautiful, large-scale community, nestle it within a pristine nature reserve and basically even maybe give some back to the community, give something back to nature and making sure that the legacy of this place is such that we can all come here and enjoy it today as well as into the next generation and so forth. For us as foreigners coming here to decide to live or Belizeans deciding to come here and live and the surrounding communities and how they are going to benefit from our being here. So to give you a little bit of background, as a sustainability director, one of the first questions is, well, what are exactly are you doing as a sustainability director? Neat title. Well, the idea of it is that I work alongside in the master planning department to make sure that the sustainability metrics, the interdependent relationships between water and soil and sun and our collective desire to be here are held in balance. And there are very specific things that can be done to make sure that any impacts that we have, we can mitigate. So I work alongside the development director, the master planner, Mark Mahaney, as well as our own core of Belizean engineers who every day live here, work here, and design piece by piece this beautiful and functional community that we're, be that we're beginning right now. So how, where was I before I got here? And that is a critical question because that gave me the context in coming in to a place that was unspoiled. I, in 2007, I started a company called Peerless Green Initiatives, and basically we were de development contractors for groups like United Nations Environment Program, United Nations Development Program, World Bank, IMF, these kind of intergovernmental uh, organizations who were specialized in going into very, very damaged ecosystems and damaged communities for one reason or another, whether it be natural calam calamity or political strife, going into these areas and actually fixing something that was horribly broken. But in juxtaposition here at Sanctuary Belize and what was so completely compelling to me is to, for the first time to look at an environmental impact assessment that starts with something that is pure, that is unmolested, that is, can be done in such a way that how can we go about making this beautiful reserve somewhere where we can live and not have a negative impact, rather than spending years and years and years in places in Southeast Asia, India, throughout the Asian subcontinent, and finding all these uh, solutions that were half solutions because of bad planning from the beginning. And this gets back to what I was talking about and how we go about in the master planning department measuring these metrics as we go along, accounting for the natural capital resource services that nature is providing us, and that seem to be free until they're taken away. Let me give you a great example. When my company was in um, India, we had a job up in Uttakhand. Uttakhand is in the furthest northern reaches of India, and it's a beautiful area that is in the highland steppes, reminiscent very much of the mountains that we have here in Belize, where people have, for time immemorial, 
been participant and lived as tribals, as communities, as small villages in these mountains, taking only as much as they need, giving back to uh, nature what it needs in a, in a harmonic balance. Well, about 10 years ago, the government of India did something that sounds pretty good. They had taken and they drew a, a circle on the map and said, this forest is now going to be this beautiful conservation area in the highland steppes of the Himalayas. Sounds good, plus one for conservation, right? Well, as a draconian measure as, as part of that policy, everybody that was in the uh, forest had to move out of the forest. So they dislocated about 20,000 people down into a valley, and that valley was where these people had to subsist for about a decade. And I'll show you one of the things that I learned and one of the things that I bring to the table here at Sanctuary Belize. And for me, it was a, um, a synergy between myself and the thoughts of our principal, our Belizean principal, Johnny Usher, who felt that if you don't provide an economy for people, they're gonna create their own economy. If you go ahead and carefully guide the path of development to inclusive, to be inclusive of communities, to be inclusive of the people who should be able to take benefit of development, because development should be a free enterprise of individuals. And in this case, where you had those folks up there in the Himalayas that were, had been displaced, they had no economy. No economy was given to them. The only economy that they ever knew was going into the forest and living from the forest. And the forest, in turn, had part of its economy dedicated to those people having to, to live there in this interdependent relationship. Once that was broken, you had to find an economy for this community. So what did they do? They would go up into the hills into the night, they would poach a log from the forest, and they did this for about 10 years, taking one tree out at a time until, and, and selling that tree on the black market so that they could feed their wife, feed their kids, feed their community, and just subsist. That is not sustainable. What ended up happening a few years ago, the lay cloud burst. A monumental biblical storm comes out of the Himalayas, dumps 10 inches of rain in one 24 hour period. That is more than most of us could absolutely uh, believe in as much rain could be falling at one time in one place. Well, what happens? When you remove the, the hardwoods from a forest, trees do something more than just creating shade, more than just creating board foot length. It actually holds up hillsides. In this particular case, the entire hillside comes down on top of the village. What happens next? Companies like mine had to get involved to come in to the rescue to figure out how to get these, com these communities back on their feet. And it was a very, very learning experience for all of us in my group that were working there. We see a lot in media, we read a lot in media about the, the people, planet, profit paradigm, three bottom line economics, sustainable economics. And that was a principal example of one that had not been planned out thoroughly from the beginning. And once that triangle of people, planet, and profit starts to degrade, once natural capital resources are taken for granted or have to be exploited and other uh, for communities to be sustainable, then we find that how things break down. And make no mistake, all the costs and all the encumbrances that we have tail back to through to us and those costs that we have to do to fix things that are broken because of a conventional system that we've been using, they come back to us in taxes and far more expenses than we absolutely need to have to have a sustainable community. So with that kind of background, I came to this place, Sanctuary Belize. I was here on a consultation basis and I met Johnny Usher. Johnny Usher said, listen, I've done my homework on you. I know who you are. If you know what you're looking at here, you'll understand what you're seeing. You'll understand the vision that we are trying to incorporate. I understood it as soon as I got here, and it came very simply for me. Johnny handed me the keys to a Polaris, one of the little buggies that we run around in here, and he said, I'm not gonna tell you a word about this place. I'm gonna give you the keys to this Polaris. You go take a ride. You tell me what you think. So it was out here, out on the savannah. 4,000 acres of conservation area. I understood the mechanism of the savanna. It's basically the world's perfect water cartridge. I understood that the mountains that we have to the, to the west of us are basically the area where you get a tremendous amount of rainfall. We get about 90 inches of rain here on the plains. We get about 120 inches of rain up on the hills. 
and it conveys very slowly across this savanna. I understood why they were preserving it. I understood why Johnny thought it was, should be the conservation heart of this beautiful development. And it was while I was driving across there, moving out of the savanna, where it was a warm day like it is today, a little bit of a breeze blowing, warm, dry, as I'm coming into waterway villages, I start to drop down, and not over a course of miles, but a course of a couple hundred yards, was able to feel the difference and have small puffs of moist, cool air hitting me in the face in this open air Polaris. I got goosebumps, folks. Reason was, I hadn't really been able to experience in very small parts of the world active microclimates that were acting out so quickly and so actively in a very compact area. So I was sold. I was sold on the idea that we had something here that was valid, that was five ecosystems. What are those five ecosystems? Well, one is this, as I've said, the savanna, which is this massive water cartridge. How does that work? Well, simply put, the savanna, although you look at it and you see grasses and you look at it in the rainy season and you can fly over it and you'll see water, is actually very, very compact. It's actually impervious clay. So what ends up happening is when water channels across the savanna, it cannot permeate, it cannot percolate down into the soil and instead has to convey its way horizontally across the soil. And what happens is all these very specialized grasses that you see here and these palmettos basically have a root system that is completely designed to live on water and the filtration of water as it comes across their root tendrils. So literally millions if not billions of small root fibers are cleansing the water clean as it comes across this savanna, comes to this side of the savanna and then starts to drop down into our deep percolation aquifers. I'll tell you one thing, folks. In every single project that we worked in between 2007 and 2012, everywhere in Asia, there is one critical component to every single one of those projects. Water, drinkable water. And the way we have gone about deranging the natural course of waters and the natural services that, those, that nature provides in something as simple as this savanna and what service it's actually providing and creating clean, potable water for us to drink, enjoy, and have here at Sanctuary Belize. That was one of the major components that brought me here, is because this particular development was taking such care in the water that was going to be the supply for not just our homes, not just our lifestyle, but the entire ecosystem here. As that water comes off the hills, conveys across the uh, savanna, drops down into our aquifer, enters into hundreds of estuaries as it moves back out into the lagoons where it provides food for the beautiful mangroves and then back out into the Caribbean and through a flow of, of cycle of this interdependent relationship and keeping that relationship intact rather than engineering in a way that just pushes water from the hills out to the sea as fast as possible. Those are where the root of a lot of our problems that we have and a lot of expense comes for something as simple. I mean, think about it. You've been drinking water out of a bottle for how many years? We've been convinced to think that drinkable water comes in bottles. It comes from the ground, folks. And if you make sure that you take care of it in a responsible manner, you build a development within a nature reserve that controls its own water destiny, its own legacy of water security, you are that much further ahead of the game because that is a valuable, valuable service that we're protecting here at Sanctuary Belize that the City River Wildlife Reserve and its five tight ecosystems care for and make sure that we are always have an abundant water supply. Many people ask, well, how did you decide how large the community was going to be? How do you know those resources are going to be supported? Well, interesting, just like I said before, we have a beautiful environmental impact assessment that tells us what we ex they expected um, impacts and what those mitigations might be. And what we've found from that is that you take a reverse approach. Rather than saying we want to have a community this big, do the natural resources support it, we went the opposite way. We looked at the natural resources and the provision of natural resources and how we can make sure that we only are taking what we need and no more, we realized then that is the scale that the community should be developed on. So the scale of this community is commensurate with what nature can provide without us influencing it into the next generation and so forth. So it's very important that we use certain factors. Certain factors like you can't take uh, your well water on your property. You can only take well water from our 
custom design system of eight zones, each well providing about 100 to 150 gallons per minute. We do our water profiling four up to eight times a year. We send it up to Bellican Laboratories where they have one of the best water labs in the entire country. Those water labs give us the feedback and the baseline so that we know we're not having any impact on the, the water systems. And we're not just doing the wells either. We actually go out into the shallows, into the lagoons, into the estuaries to make sure that our outputs are not influencing the pH, the alkalinity, the, the TSS, total suspended solids, the turbidity. All these data profiles we're always measuring to make sure that one, we're only taking as much as we need, and two, that we're not having any long-term effect on this interdependent mechanical relationship that we're having with this beautiful system that is the City River Wildlife Reserve. Other things, you can't do irrigation off, of you, off the well. That's an important component. Irrigation is a very, very large consumer of water. We also encourage you in the design department, of which I sit and Mark Mahaney sits, in the design department to help you uh, organize and develop your little piece of paradise. What I realized very quickly here was we're doing macro planning, yes, and that's the big city picture. But actually what it comes down to in many cases is like a quilt. Each square, each lot has to be carefully designed to make sure that the sum of the entire quilt is strong and robust. And that is doing things like helping you with your wastewater management, using se sequence batch reactors, small package systems, a state-of-the-art package system out at the beach club, another one that's going to be our irrigation pond and our showcase garden that'll be an expression of our value system for everybody to see that is coming down at the marina. Boats from foreign flags coming in, stopping off, taking a stroll through our garden it is actually our wastewater treatment and our irrigation pond. Being able to buy uh, small value item items like peanut butter and organic vegetables that are grown right here on site. And that's something I want to talk to you about in just a few moments. How we go about it actually creating more of a micro economy while we're making this city in the jungle. Okay, let's talk a little bit about microeconomies and what that means for Sanctuary Belize and the City River Wildlife Reserve. We're here at the Garden Center, which is one of the principal areas where we have all our landscaping materials, uh, a little bit of a food garden that we hope to expand into a CSA. CSA is a community-supported agriculture system in which homeowners would be able to buy a share. That share would be used to cover the overheads of our farming. Then in return for your share, you get some uh, portion of a, a weekly uh, bushel of whatever's in season. But what this area represents, everything here, other than being absolutely gorgeous and giving us a lot of this color, because we've got plenty of green out in the jungle. Uh, certain times of the year, like this one, the Kraybu comes into bloom. Uh, some of the Yemery trees, the taller trees that you see behind me, will come into this beautiful yellow bloom next month, uh, May, June, uh, as well as Mayflowers coming on and you, all of a sudden they, they pop against this green canopy. So one of the things that we focus on from a practical standpoint or an aesthetic standpoint is making sure we have lots of things down here that have color. Why are we, why are we concerned about that in the least? Because it's called end use paradigm. End use paradigm is you're coming down here, you buy a lot, you wanna build a home here. What's the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do? You're gonna enjoy the natural uh, flora of the region and represent it in your yard through your landscaping. So along with some well site planned uh, uh, clearing, where we make sure that we're not just clear cutting everything, we respect those side buffers. Those side buffers that you have in your yard are gonna be important for you uh, to control one thing in particular, water. Uh, it rains here quite a bit, 80, 90 inches, like I said, on the plains. So that's a lot of water that has to be processed off of your particular piece of property, and nothing drinks water better than the small brush and conservation buffer areas that we ask you to have along your perimeter. One, it is going to give you that privacy. Two, it's going to give you that sense of place, destination. You're coming here because of all this. Why would you want to remove all of it and live in just another tract home? Of course, you're living within a nature reserve. We can never forget that. And part of that, part of living in a reserve and being in somebody else's country, the beautiful country of Belize, its people are very welcoming and open arms for anybody who comes to their country that is willing to be participant in the development of the country. And this very garden center is doing that. Let me explain to you how. I can give you an example. All that you see here, 
this landscaping material is all going to eventually be potted up, taken to somebody's yard here or one of the common areas, planted and maintained. And that takes people. The people that we take, and 18 or 20 of them that work here every day, are tending to these. We have a small greenhouse and we're going to expand that so that we're able to have a bigger variety and more shoots. We harden them out here on the property, about 10 acres here, another 20 acres down further to our west where we'll be able to have a bigger garden. Bigger gardens because you need and the demand is such that people are now coming in, starting to build, wanting landscaping materials. That's the end use paradigm. The other end of that paradigm is every one of these plants represents jobs. We are, if you want to find out the reputation of Sanctuary Belize, there's no better way than to go around the seven or eight local communities here. Places like Silkgrass, Maya Center, Santa Cruz. All these areas are where we source our labor. And the reason why we do that is very simple. We have to make sure that we're good neighbors, that we're not living in this cocoon of expats that are coming down to Belize to live a nice lifestyle and not include the Belizean people who are hosting us, whether we're residents or not. So what we do here is we have somebody like Joel, who's a very gifted young Belizean man who has a background in gardening as well as design. So when it comes time for landscaping, you just stop by here. You check out which kind of varieties that you'd like. You walk the gardens with Joel. He'll do a beautiful design for your home. Of course, all these things come at a cost, but that's what supports this economy. Your community supporting this economy. This economy is resulting in people that are coming here every day, able to work 20 or 30 in jobs that they would not otherwise have. I mean, do your homework. Look at Stan Creek, Belize. It's one of the most underemployed di districts of the entire country of Belize. Why is that? Because there's really only four jobs. You can pick an orange, pack an orange, pick a banana, pack a banana. You don't have one of those jobs. You probably do not have a job in this district. So rather than having these people fleeing up to Belize City, we're providing jobs for them here. Right on the other side of the river, less than a mile away, is City River Village. We bring them over just not far from here, across the river on a little ferry boat every morning. And we also take them back home at night. What that allows them to do is have an income here, be able to go back to their own villages and bring that prosperity back to their village. And that way they can even tuck their kids in at night. It's a beautiful story because it's the right thing to do. I can tell you, having gone to Guatemala and been asked to go and look at a beautiful development there, they wanted a green rating from our company. Uh, we went over there and my, my report started before I even entered the gate. When I got to the gate, I see a gate. Of course, we have security here. You have to check who's coming in and out. But it was the character of the gate. 12 foot walls that went on as far as the eye could see in both directions. Razor wire on top of those walls. And every 100 yards or so, a chap with a shotgun. That's not the type of community that we have here because we don't need it. It goes back to what I was talking about before. If we don't create an economy, people will create their own economy. They will look at you as an economy. It's called disassociation tolerance. And the way to avoid that is to do things like this. Here at this beautiful garden center, a community supported agriculture, the showcase gardens that we'll have down at the marina, where you'll be able to go in, walk through these beautiful gardens, and we'll be inviting vendors from all over to come in and trade their wares, do some of their value-added crafts. That way they don't have to get on a bus and go 40 miles away and hope to sell one jar of peanut butter or one jar of Krebu jam. They'll be able to have a central location where we, as the custodians of this community, will be able to reap the benefits of all these beautiful things of Belize, and then those people that are just our neighbors around us will be able to enjoy the benefits of us being here into perpetuity, legacy for them, that they can send their kids to school and have the incomes that come with these type of projects. That's what Sanctuary Belize is all about. It's not just about the flora and the fauna, but it's the whole package, the people, planet, profit paradigm. Let me take you down to the wood shop and I'll show you the sawmill and you'll get an idea of one other area where we're doing the same type of end use paradigm microeconomy building for this beautiful area. Okay, we're here at the sawmill at Sanctuary Belize City River Wildlife Reserve. Again, one more microeconomy that I'll explain to you a little bit about, but also part of something very important, our biomass program. A uh, biomass program in this case is every time we cut down some roads and clear in some roads, we end up with a lot of these trees. But we upcycle them. We take them, uh, those trees, cure them from here. They go into the sawmill. 
into boards. Some of those boards become like pine boards for form boards for pouring concrete so for the builders. Others go up to the cabinet shop, which is just maybe a mile from here on the other side of the property where some fine craftsmen can turn your dreams of Belizean hardwood furniture, cabinetry, you name it. Come down to our beach club. We've got uh, picnic tables that are made from Santa Maria wood, uh, sapodilla floors, like the, one, the, the wood that you see curing behind me, uh, cabinetry, mahogany deck chairs, you name it. There's a lot of furniture that we have to make, a lot of cabinets that we have to make just for the development alone, but also for you as the homeowner that come here when you're building your home, you've got your landscaping, check that off as the box. Next box, cabinetry, furniture, you can have it all done here from trees that came from this property. It creates a very special relationship, whether it be a tree from your own yard that has to be removed so that you can build your home, or it's one of the trees that had to come down to create the roads. But there also goes beyond that. A lot of times we have um, bramble and so forth. We char that down. That char is valuable as a, as a micro uh, organism collector. Uh, char works almost like the coral reef. Uh, giving a, a matrix for micronutrients to grow on and improving the soil that we have up at the garden center, for example. So all these things are interrelated. They also are, are necessary um, mitigations that we have to have for environmental impact. Uh, one of the first consultancies that I came down on for this project was quite unique. They wanted to see if they could ex uh, achieve energy independence. Uh, on a grid here at 28 cents a kilowatt, obviously things like solar make a whole lot of sense for alternate energy. But we were also looking at creating something that we were doing in one of my projects overseas in Asia, uh, biogas, utilizing biochar and actually charring down a through a process called pyrolation and creating energy from uh, either agricultural waste or wood scraps. Any of these things can be then utilized into producer gas. And once in producer gas, you can fire generators, you can fire engines, you can create energy for a fraction of the cost of the grid energy. Those are things that are coming over the next horizon here at Sanctuary Belize. Obviously, we have to take these things one step at a time. It's a big, big project, ambitious. Uh, Mark Mahaney once said, name me one other city that you can say has been built between three to five years, and that's a great point to make. But we're starting from the beginning and realizing that when we're cutting in these roads, we're taking out something that is a valuable uh, asset of the development, and it's this beautiful wood. Seven different varieties of hardwood here in uh, Belize. Belize took the, uh, the encouraging action of saying that they were going to protect their forests. They took one third of the country and put it under conservation. Interestingly, because of families like the Usher family and the culture of Belize, there's over 125 square miles of the country that are held in private conservation. One of those is this, the City River Wildlife Reserve. And honestly, folks, from what I have been able to gather in my time overseas and a lot of these projects, there are three type of people that you can count on and understanding that dynamic relationship that occurs between nature and human economy. Natural economy and the mechanics and interdependent relationships and human economy. Those three people are forests, farmers, and fishermen. And fortunately for us, our principal and very much the reason I'm here to begin with is because Johnny Usher falls into and his family fall into two of those categories. They were farmers and they were fishermen. In the shrimp industry, his grandfather brought over the very first stock of Jamaican heat tolerant citrus that started the citrus industry here in Belize. And those are the people that you can count on that have that deep understanding of if you start taking too much, you start becoming too intensive in your farming, too intensive in your fishing, and you're not accounting for the value of nature, then it's going to come back on you. There will be one, one reason or another the agriculture will fail or the shrimping will fail. Everything has to be held in a very key balance. So it's the reason that we have these type of systems and these type of programs that we are encouraging starting from the beginning so that they can evolve with the community. And also, one other thing, when the country of Belize took one third of the country and said those are under conservation, they also said no more con commercial exportation of hardwood furniture. They didn't want to go down the road of Honduras who had taken out one third of their forest within 10 years because they looked at a single line economy for their country and that was the exportation of furniture. And the exportation of furniture led to what? The depletion of their entire forests. And you look at their rivers and you look at the flooding and the problems that they're having now, all attributable back to a bad decision that Belize avoided. However, 
Just like the story that I told you from Utakon, you've got people that are part of that economy, skilled craftsmen who no longer had jobs at any factories that exported furniture. Well, guess what? They're coming in from all over the country. We've got almost 20 skilled craftsmen that are working right here at our wood shop, here at this sawmill, at the fine furniture uh, shop, and they're exercising their skill and they're training new generation of Belizeans to be fine woodworkers. It's a beautiful paradigm. It's that three bottom line that we're looking for. And I invite you all to come down here, take a look at the beautiful things that we're doing here as part of our biomass project now and into the future. Legacy again. Okay, here we are at one of the most important locations in the development. This lonely little pipe right here is Sapadilla Ridge Phase 2, Zone 8 Well. And uh, this is a perfect example of how our waters come across this big, beautiful savanna, scrubbed clean, dropped down into an aquifer. This particular puppy is about 60 feet down when we started wa hitting water. The base is a granite base like I have here in my hand, which makes the water what? Soft. Uh, many parts of the Caribbean, other parts of northern Belize, have lim limestone deposits which make their water hard. Uh, in our particular area, we're on an outcrop of the Coxcomb Basin. Uh, gives us a high granite content in the water and it makes our water very sweet. Also picks up very nice trace minerals like magnesium and selenium, things that our doctors are saying that we need in our drinking water and we are no longer getting because we've been convinced that drinking water comes from bottles. Uh, going back, like I said, one of the if you read the World Economic Forum report of 2014, one of the top 10 most critical resources and uh, risks for global economy is simple as this, drinking water. And that's why we manage this so carefully. We're using state-of-the-art HDPE lines to make sure that the quality that you get at your tap is the same that's coming out of this well. The reason that we have our well set up on this kind of a nodal system that's interconnected so that this well can support another well should another well show any kind of anomaly or have any problems with their pressure pumps, anything like that, they can cover for one another. Also, this gives us great monitoring capability. It also makes sure that we know as much water as we're consuming off of this well versus what we know this well can output. So are all these things and cues that we're taking from the international community, uh, places like where back uh, my home in Annapolis, Maryland, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, who for many, many years has been advocating different manners of making sure that we take care of the estuaries and then into the water catchment out into our bays, our lagoons. We have all these interactive relationships that have to be protected. So we take things like this and we don't take them for granted. We take things like this and we make sure that we monitor and manage their consumption. Going back to making sure that you have ways of doing rainwater catchment. All these things are part of your design guideline and there are things that people like myself, Mark Mahaney, our engineers and others are there to help and guide you so that you make sure that you're using this critical and beautiful resource for every generation coming forward, as well as making sure that you're taking advantage of all of this that you have here. Every time it rains, why not catch some of that rainwater, have it into your irrigation water, and then be able to support all your beautiful landscaping that way. It's just good sense and good policy. When Aldo Leopold talked about a land ethic, he talked about the trinity of water, soil, and sun, and our relationship with those three, interdependent, making sure that we're accounting for the value of these things and making sure that we're not taking more than the next generation needs. And that next generation doesn't just include us as humans, but also the flora, the fauna, the little fox that shows up for a snack in our backyard, all those great things that have to be able to stay intact in order for us to have this beautiful pyramid and this beautiful five eco lifestyle. And it starts right here. There's nothing more critical than water. That's why we take such good care of it. We're so uh, cautious in how our use is and making sure we monitor it and make sure that we're adopting best practices. It's a global movement right here, folks. And we're starting it right here at Sanctuary Belize. Okay, guys, I hope that has given you a little bit of context about this big, beautiful property. Uh, the value system that we're trying to incorporate at the master planning level where it needs to be done. You can implement these things in the front end of a project like this and the legacy of that decision making. Things like the HDPE lines, the garden center, the wood shop. These are all value added items but they also integrate very well into something that we're trying to promote. It's simple folks, a land ethic. 
It's something that has been buried in our DNA for a very long time, and it's something we need to rekindle. Because since the mechanized age, we have been convinced that the only way to go about things is the conventional method of take, and not worry about nature, and thinking that nature will just continue to give indefinitely. We now know that that was a bad mistake, and that's okay, because we now have the benefit of some superior technology that the mechanized age delivered to us. And utilizing that technology and our new understanding of this deep, complex interrelationship between we as humans and nature as an entity, as a stakeholder, as something that needs to be engaged at the table and considered, and how much the nature can provide without us asking too much of her. And this is what our goal is here at Sanctuary Belize, for it to actually be sanctuary, for you to be able to come back. For my young son who's seven years old, I want him to come back when he's my age and have the same, if not a better, experience here in loving and beautiful Belize. Thanks so much. Enjoy your stay at Sanctuary Belize. And if you're not here, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks so much.